families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Families Divided. In this edition, Dr. Colleen Murray will be speaking with Dr. Alan Blotsky on the voice of the alienated child. What is the voice of the alienated child? What is it doing to them and nobody is listening when they are alienated from not only their parents, but also their grandparents and many other members of their family? Please pay close attention. I even pray that some of you that are targeting these children from their family will listen and see what you're doing to your children. We'll be back in just a moment with this segment. At Victor's Crown, our focus is on you, our clients. When you arrive, our goal is that you will feel at home from our welcoming atmosphere to our serene surroundings. Everything we do at Victor's Crown is done with our clients in mind. We have comfortable seating areas for both adults and children. A large screen TV with surround sound where clients can be occupied with wholesome entertainment while they wait. We offer complimentary refreshments such as coffee, tea, water, and snacks. Due to the present COVID pandemic, our in-person appointments are restricted to selected cases, and those are held in our luxurious outdoor open air meeting space that we affectionately refer to as the COVID cabana, which was built specifically for our clients to offer them the most comfortable and relaxing outdoor space available. All our other clients are offered secured web-based telemed sessions where they can connect with us from anywhere in the world. Hello and welcome to this panel segment of Families Divided. When a family is involved in a custody or modification case, the term voice of the child is often used. It means the view of the child or children regarding their choice, options, feelings, and emotions regarding the custody or modification hearing. However, in an alienation case, the voice of the child is manipulated and managed by the targeted parent. Today I'll be talking to Dr. Alan Blotke about this concept of the voice of the alienated child and discuss mm -hmm. how and why an alienated child's voice is not really their own and what that means when considering the child's input in custody and modification cases and the impact of being an alienated child on their developmental needs and psychological growth over a lifetime. Hello, Alan, how are you today? Good, how are you? Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for being here with us. Before we dive into the alienated voice of the child, um, why don't we set some foundational groundwork here and, and talk about why it is that their voice is hindered can we talk about the psychological and emotional ramifications of parental alienation? Well, let's, let's start with just the definition. Parental alienation uh, is a set of behaviors that one parent does uh, in order to convince the child 
that the other parent is uh, bad, is dangerous, is unloving, is unworthy uh, in an attempt to disrupt or even sever that child's relationship with the other parent. Uh, when I say it's a set of behaviors, that's exactly what I mean. It's various different strategies, tactics, techniques that a parent will utilize sometimes in a short period of time and sometimes over weeks and months, if not longer, in order to convince this child to reject the other parent. That's what parental alienation is. Um, it is considered child abuse, especially in its severest form. In other words, when a child gets to the point where he or she is totally rejecting one of the parents, that means that that child has been subjected to abuse. And that's because we know through research that children need to have good relationships with both parents that both parents need to have an active role in a child's life in order for that child to develop normally, healthily, um, and in the best way possible. So that when one parent tries to make sure that the other parent is rejected, is gone, is absent, that by definition is abusive behavior and the child has been subjected to abuse. So when we, when we consider this, I, uh, that it is child abuse, how is it that um, professionals that take what a child says um, mm -hmm. at face value, how is it that that minimizes or even misses the impact of the alienation on the child or teenagers? So when a child is rejecting of one of the parents, if you interview that child, that child will spend 99.9% .9 of the time uh, saying negative, derogatory, terrible things about the parent. They won't say anything positive. It's a totally negative, distorted view of that parent. And so that's the red flag that tells me that their view of that parent is not accurate. And therefore, I can't take what that child says to me at face value because it's so distorted, it's so inaccurate that you just can't take it at face value. That's a mistake that a lot of professionals do make. Attorneys make it, judges make it, parent coordinators make it, mediators make it, even some mental health professionals have made it, that it's a mistake to take what the child says at face value. If you suspect that that child has been subjected to alienation, that that child is alienated, then it is a terrible mistake to take what that child says at face value. And if you do take it at face value, what you're really doing is hastening the process, not stopping it. It's actually reinforcing the alienation rather than reversing it. And so then you become a part of the problem in actuality. And I see this on a day-to-day -day basis in my practice where the child's attorney, the guardian ad litem, actually becomes part of the problem because he or she is reinforcing the alienation without even really realizing that he or she is doing that. And so it makes the problem even harder to deal with. I, I would imagine, and I would imagine that um, a child in this situation, especially in the early stages um, and somewhat in the, in the later stages, deep down they know that something is wrong. Maybe they don't have the word abuse or parental alienation, but deep down they know because they've experienced the targeted parent and a lot of the things that are happening aren't really from their experience. Um, as you and I both know, a lot of times it starts out 
with the alienating parent laying the foundation of things that happened prior to the child's wisdom and knowledge um, to kind of lay the foundation of this is how this parent's always been. Right. Um, but that, that being taken into consideration and adults, especially when we have lawyers, guardian litems, judges, you know, all agreeing with the child and this reinforcing this confusion within the child. And I, I would imagine that the child begins to believe that everything has to be true because all of these adults are saying that. And so as this goes on, what is the impact for a child um, the, on their psychological, social, and academic functioning during, during this time that they're going through? Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's ironic, and it's one of the counterintuitive things about parental alienation that the professionals who are involved in these cases who are trying to be helpful actually are making things worse. Uh, that's, that's a terrible role to be in, but I see it all the time. So in early stages of alienation, when the child is what we would say is mildly alienated or perhaps moderately alienated, the child still is experiencing some ambivalence about the targeted parent, some conflict about the targeted parent. They're feeling guilty. They know that things are not right, that what they're hearing doesn't really match their own experience with the parent. And so you can kind of capitalize on that, and that's part of the intervention. Where we get into really serious trouble is with the severely alienated child who is 100% convinced of the badness of the targeted parent. And so you then have a guardian ad litem and a judge and a parent coordinator and a mediator who's buying into that. And so that just reinforces that uh, alienated position for the child. And it makes reversing the alienation that much harder. And that's, again, what I confront on a daily basis in cases where the attorneys and the judges and the coordinators have made things so much worse because the alienation is almost now cooked in because they've reinforced it. And so the ambivalence that the child was experiencing is gone. The conflict is gone. Uh, and so severely alienated kids can be really difficult to manage. Uh, and that's uh, the, the, the hardest part uh, of uh, alienation cases. And so are they also difficult to handle um, academically or with their friends? How does that kind of bleed over into other areas of their life, if you will? Well, uh, I always use school grades as an example of I've seen kids who are severely alienated from a parent who are making straight A's. My rule of thumb is I don't go by school grades at all. I've seen too many kids uh, who are embroiled in the middle of parental alienation who are still functioning pretty well at school. So I don't really use that as a red flag. Now, there are uh, lots of kids who are caught in the middle of an alienation process do manifest a lot of other red flags. Um, they may be angry at one parent, but they're also showing signs of being anxious. Uh, they're more oppositional with everybody, including the alienating parent. Uh, their relationships with peers can get all messed up uh, and uh, lots of fractures in those relationships. Uh, they start lying uh, to other people because, you know, alienation really is a big lie. And so they've learned to lie and to be deceitful. And so you begin to see behavior problems uh, at home and with other people that are red flags as to the fact that they're not doing all that well, even though they say they are. That's the catch. They say they're doing well but they're really not. So um, what I hear you saying is that um, 
sometimes a child will use the opportunity for uh, school to be their grades or, or whatever as a place where they can be more themselves and more um, aligned with who they are. However, once they start to do some interpersonal interactions, um, that's where the hard part comes because they're missing some of um, those developmental skills or, or conflict resolution skills. Um, and they've learned some traits that, uh, that aren't really based in reality, lying, deceiving, and they continue those on in their interpersonal relationships. Is that, is that a good summarization of? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, I think some kids probably relish the idea of going to school where they can kind of clear their mind and concentrate on their academics. And that's, that's what I find happens more often than not. But when it gets back down to being in the home, being in the family or being with friends or extended family members, uh, a lot of the uh, ongoing issues uh, simmer up uh, and become problems again. And so there are all kinds of red flags uh, that you will see uh, with these kids if you look closely. And uh, if you could, Alan, as we start to wrap up here, can you discuss the impact of parental alienation on a child's lifetime, like as they move into adulthood? Yeah, I mean, the impact of parental alienation on kids, again, is minimized, and, and a lot of people don't understand it. Um, even, even in mildly alienated kids, they tend to show long-term problems into adulthood. And let me just say from the outset as a prime example, a lot of these kids who have been alienated as children end up being in relationships later on in life where alienation becomes an issue again. So there's sort of a reenactment of that uh, as they get older. But uh, anxiety, is a problem into adulthood. Depression is a problem into adulthood. Uh, lack of trust in relationships uh, is a problem that persists. Uh, a tendency to lie and be deceitful can really get baked in and becomes a prominent pattern in adulthood. Um, so a mixture of all of those substance abuse is more common in kids who have been alienated than non-alienated kids. So there's a mixture of psychological and interpersonal problems that uh, get baked in and become prominent as the kids get older into adulthood. It's not a benign process. There's a reason we focus on it, and it's because we know that it has terrible consequences now and going forward. Yeah, so uh, it sounds like the voice of the child then becomes the voice of the adult child of alienation. And that voice continues to impact their choices, their options, their feelings, and their emotions um, regarding all of their interpersonal relationships. Yeah, and let me just say this, that the good news is that there is treatment. The good news is that there is intervention. Uh, and so uh, if a treatment is instituted, if it's done in the right way, uh, things can get better. Alienation can be reversed. Uh, the child can grow from it and learn from it and have a positive outcome. Um, and so that's the good news. The good news is that there is treatment. Treatment can be effective. Treatment is effective. Uh, and that's what we always hope for in these cases. Well, thank you so much for uh, you. helping us land uh, in a positive way uh, this very um, heartbreaking discussion in regards to the, the child's and eventually the adult child's of alienation's voice. 
And so thank you so much for that, that hope that you have given those out there that have either experienced this um, as a parent, or maybe they are an adult child right. um, of alienation. So, so thank you so much. Um, and we really appreciate you being here. Sure. With us. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I really do. Thank you. And to our audience, um, as we continue to explore these topics in the coming uh, weeks and months, if one of our topics really touches you, but we didn't touch on a question that you are just burning to ask um, one of our um, experts or even somebody that has been on that uh, has experienced alienation in their personal life, please send us your questions and we'll see if we can't ask one of our experts or one of our uh, other guests that question. Again, we thank you for joining us for this panel of Families Divided and we'll see you next time. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. In families dealing with alienation, communication during conflict is often very difficult. This fall, Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, will present a special in-person conference to address that very issue. Using and Refining Interpersonal Skills will be held September 9th through the 11th at the Marriott Research Triangle Park in Durham, North Carolina. You'll learn from experts how to master skills that can reduce anxiety, anger, and stress in alienation situations. Join event director Elaine Cobb, the founder and president of Family Access Fighting for Children's Rights, and conference moderator Dr. Colleen Murray as they present a lineup of highly respected experts, including keynote speaker Dr. Jeffrey Gardier, plus presentations by Bill Eddy, Megan Hunter, Dr. Joshua Coleman, Dr. Mark Moss, Dr. Mary Alvarez, Dr. Sue Cornbluth, Shazia Sparkman, and Lisa Rothfuss. Mark your calendar now, September 9th through the 11th, for Using and Refining Interpersonal Skills, hosted by Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, Steel Partners Foundation, and PAICA, Parental Alienation is Child Abuse. Visit familyaccess.info for more details on the conference and secure your attendance. Seating is limited. Hello, I'm Elaine Cobb. I'm president and founder of Family Access Fighting for Children's Rights, your host and also executive producer of Families Divided TV. We hope and pray that these segments that we send to you weekly and biweekly are a major help to you in understanding more about alienation, about what it is doing to not only you, but to your children and grandchildren and some of you who may not even realize you yourselves are in alienation now. Our prayer is that many families will be saved through this. Many reunifications will take place. This program is brought to you solely by Family Access Fighting for Children's Rights. We would truly appreciate your donations as that would help us greatly in our work and in our ministry. We also would like for you to send us your prayer requests with the email address listed at the bottom of the screen as we do wanna pray for you daily. And if you have any suggestions on things that you would like to be brought up here at Families Divided, please let us know at also the email listed at the bottom of the screen. 
I also wanted to quickly share with you before leaving you this segment, uh, some success stories that we've just received this week. One is a grandmother who says that she was alienated from her granddaughter for 2,550 days. They met together just recently in a park. As the granddaughter saw her grandmother, she ran to her with her arms wide open. What an amazing and inspirational story. And I have a picture of them, which I cannot share with you, but the smiles on both their faces is such an inspiration. We also had a mom who is who has been alienated from her adult son. She had dinner with him just recently and spent a few hours with him. Before leaving him, she hugged him. He let her hug him and she told him that she loved him. And in response, he told her he loved her too. And they have texted since as well. So I'm telling you these stories and I hope to be able to share more with you and helping you to know, please don't ever give up. You've got to stay strong. You've got to trust God. You've got to keep focused and do what is best for you, your children and your grandchildren. Keep them first in your thoughts and what the situation is doing. We'll be here to help you in every way that we can. And we hope to see you again soon. Please also share our videos and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It helps us greatly in getting this ministry out there. I hope and pray for all of you as I do every day, as does my husband as well, that one day soon you'll be back with your family as we hope and pray we'll be back with our granddaughter, Dare, and our son, Brian. God bless. Join us again next week on Families Divided when we'll feature retired Israeli judge Philip Marcus, who will talk about protecting the very important child-parent contact after separation. Plus, Dr. Colleen Murray returns to share how to preserve the integrity of the alienated parent. If you miss any episode of Families Divided, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. Plus, don't forget to subscribe so you'll receive notifications when new video content is added.